I've said this before and I'll say it again, that the first century in Jewish history is completely gepacked. It's not only gepacked, but it's got this, um, this effervescence of messianic tension underlying it everywhere you look. And we don't have time now to go into all of the political uh, machinations of the, uh, of the different levels uh, <laughs> of political things going on and uh, theological things going on. We're going to laser-like focus on the messianic idea. That we're looking at a framework of two worlds, the now and the future. Good evening, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to part two of the series, uh, The Messianic Idea in Jewish History. And obviously, uh, I'm uh, casual tonight because I'm at home, uh, as we are all at home, uh, because we are uh, in lockdown. But I'm hoping that we can at least perhaps recreate the experience of, uh, of what this talk might have been like if I'd been able to continue it in the, in the venue of last week. Uh, we spent quite some time last week talking about the uh, Messianic idea in Jewish history as it evolved in the period of the Tanakh, in the biblical period, and also how it uh, propelled forward, really, some of the developments in Jewish history. Those events that were motivated by the Messianic idea then, in turn, uh, propel further developments within the messianic idea. And the basic shift, as you can see uh, in the idea, uh, as we understand it, happens pretty much uh, the, the big pivotal point is the exile of uh, J the Judean kingdom and the Judean people at the end of, uh, pretty much at the end of the Tanakh and subsequently the exile and then the return from Babylon and uh, we saw really that the idea of a uh, restorative Davidic king who would be a kind of ideal leader, we saw that that uh, carried through the exilic period, but that it kind of came to a bit of a fizz uh, in Zerubbabel. And that's what we covered last week, the messianic figures uh, that emerged, you know, the Hezekiah, Josiah, uh, and Zerubbabel that emerged from the biblical narrative. But then we notice that this idea of a universal king of justice that's going to usher in the, the new eon, the new age, uh, a, a fulfillment, if you like, of the full prophetic vision of the anointed one of the house of David, we see that that, is go, that, that idea... <laughs> Um, as an eschatology, as an end of times uh, usherance, goes into a little bit of a quiet period uh, during the Persian phase. And we know that, uh, we talked about this a little last week, that perhaps that is a little bit like being in the uh, Commonwealth of Nations, where really the, 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 the supreme ruling power is reasonably benevolent and they let you get on with what you want to get on with and the circumstances don't really justify the effort that it would take to rebel and revolt and restore a new international order. Uh, there's just not enough motivation to do that or enough incentive to want that uh, and all the trouble that that would entail. Which, of course... Uh, <laughs> brings us up to what I'm going to talk about tonight. And uh, we're going to kick off <laughs> uh, basically at the very, towards the end of the Second Temple period, in let's say its last century. We know that the Bayit Sheni, the Second Temple, was destroyed in around about 70 CE, or pretty much perhaps even exactly 70 CE, and uh, so when we talk about the last century of the Second Temple, we're talking about late in the first century BCE and throughout the first century CE. 
that is when we see a full resurgence of uh, the messianic bubbling up, if you like. But this time, by now, the idea has been uh, wedded on to another form of messianic expectation, which we might, we might call the apocalyptic, which means now I'm going to unpack what that means for us in terms of Jewish ideas and Jewish history. There are some scholars who believe that the whole idea of the welding of that pre-axilic idea of the Davidic ideal king and that came through the Galut in, of, of Babylon in the 6th century in some form and played a, a part in the early Second Temple that the welding of that idea with an eschatology of a great king of a new era is actually rather late because and there are scholars who think that and I, I had to be careful how I, how I worded that uh, because, because there is a background of what they well, uh, the, 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 all of this is just prelude but it, it, I just want to give you a taste of the fact that scholars don't really know the, the, these are estimates at the moment but it seems that it was welded to a resonance of eschatology of some kind of new world order uh, that was going to be imminent anytime soon that was generally around late Hellenic eschatological thinking. Like in the late Hellenic phase, these ideas were arising in a number of different places. So it's hard to say whether they originated from us and then spread outwards or whether they uh, spread inwards or whether or not, in fact, uh, there was just synchronicitous um, formation of different ideas. The reality is that what we do know is that by the time you get to the late 1st century BCE, and some scholars have, have, have done uh, a lot of analysis on this as to where it, uh, it, 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 on the development of ideas around the circumstances that were happening in the world at that time, but they basically emerge a picture of, and this is not only generally true, but it's acutely true within uh, Jewish ideological thought, that there are two worlds. There are two worlds. There is, at the end of the day, I mean, describe those worlds how you want, but at the end of the day, there's the, the, the picture we have in our head if we're in the middle of all this in the first century BCE is that there are two worlds. The now and the future. They are two worlds. The question becomes, how do we transition from the now to the future? And I want to, I actually wanted to, uh, and, and, and that picture is our, our kind of working mental framework uh, once we come into that period of Jewish history that's going to create some of the most intense messiahs and the most famous messiahs that have emerged from the Jewish world. And before I did that, I, before we launch into that, I, I wanted to, uh, I want to read you uh, a midrash. Well, uh, it's a midrash that is uh, actually, I've, I've got it printed out here on a piece of paper. Uh, it's a midrash, but it's a midrash that appears actually in, uh, in the Gemara. So, although you might think, oh, David, we've come here to learn some Jewish history and, you know, how the intersection of ideas and history, or well, what are you reading us from a text? And that is because this text, <laughs> in a way, I will, this text, uh, which is remarkable, uh, is one of those texts which in itself is a complete window on an ideological framework that we're going to look at. Because the idea of, the idea of two worlds, of a now and a future, that's happening generally. But it takes on a very, very specific kind of... Uh, Jewish inflection, and it's thematic to what I want to talk about uh, this evening, and it is this. 
Tanu Rabbanan. So the rabbis learnt, uh, when the Talmud says Tanu Rabbanan, it means they're going to quote from something that is a brita, which means that it is Tanaitic uh, in its dating. So we're talking about a text that was, uh, as for, if we can rely on the transmission of the Talmud, it was a text that was uh, enunciated uh, either in the first or, or second century CE. So it's getting now very, very close to the outlook. But <laughs> I would venture to say, as anyone uh, who will be listening to this talk twice would be able to tell you, that it is almost uh, impossible to locate this text before uh, the middle of the second century. Tanu Rabbanan. Our rabbis have taught, Mashiach ben David, the Messiah, son of David, she'atid lehigalot b'mihera v'yamenu, who is destined to be revealed speedily in our days. Omer lo akadosh baruch hu, God says to him, God's having a conversation with the Messiah in the Talmud. He says to him, Ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. Because it says, Asaprael Chok. We go and it quotes the famous the verse from Psalms two, and uh, it is uh, Psalms two, um, where the verse begins. Uh, I shall say how it is, and I think it's two seven. I have this day born you, given birth to you, says God says to the Messiah. Shalmi meni vetena, ask of me and I will give it. Goyim nachalatech, I'll make nations your inheritance. Making nations your inheritance, by the way, of course, is one of the promises given to, uh, to the Messiah and to the Jewish people. V'kevan so the Messiah gets offered by God. Basically, you know what? <laughs> Just tell me, and boom, I'll go and do it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you whatever you want, which means that we now move into the Messianic age. You're going to be revealed, uh, and uh, all nations are going to be subjugated to Israel and to you. This is the uh, rabbinic picture, the picture that's emerging in the Talmud from the second century, and uh, that'll be the Messianic age. Just tell me, and it's going to happen. In other words... <laughs> It's up to the Messiah. And the Messiah knows, apparently, that uh, his, um, his own profile is going to be associated with this redemption, that uh, there may even well be cults built around it. So, the, 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 the Talmud doesn't relate exactly what it is that Messiah requires, but uh, I get what, what he thought about at first, but it says, but since the Messiah, having, uh, you know, pondering over this question, since he saw the Messiah, the son of Joseph, who had been killed, he says before God, master of the world, I am only asking from you, I seek ask nothing from you, except life. And he asks God to resuscitate the killed Messiah, son of Joseph. God says, you want life. Even before you said that, your father David has already prophesied about that question. As it says in verse, and now we go to Psalms 21. He asked life of you and you gave it to him. <laughs> I have to make the caveat that, uh, that I made last week that almost every single uh, clause of every single sentence I'm talking about is its own subject in Jewish studies. Of course, those psukim and their interpretation and so on, Psalm 2 has become uh, 
one of the big celebrity texts in uh, Judeo-Christian polemics over the last uh, millennia and a half, and we're not going to go down that road to unpack that and the psalm and that midrash, uh, the idea that there is a Messiah, the son of David, and Messiah, the son of Joseph, uh, which, of course, depends in the ultimate sense on the prophecy of Ezekiel that there will be to basically a union of the house of Joseph and the house of Israel. The sages understood that to mean that each one has its own Messiah, that each Messiah has a different role. I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk, but I wanted to start with that text because it is just astonishingly reflective of where we're going to head uh, in the next uh, little while. So everything by that was kind of by way of introduction, and I want to bring you up to uh, <laughs> the first century CE, uh, and as I have said many times, and in fact, I mean, look, I've done my introduction. Oh. Oh. Sorry, I can't take off my jacket. I lost the audio. There we go. You want, you want to do it? Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry about this. That was supposed to be... Uh, that was supposed to be a, a smooth man move, that. It wasn't. It uh, ended up being a, a technological uh, tripwire. All right. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, that the first century in Jewish history is completely gepacked. And, uh, and I've just given a 15-minute introduction showing that it's not only gepacked, but it's got this... Um, this effervescence of messianic tension underlying it everywhere you look. And we don't have time now to go into all of the political uh, machinations of the, uh, of the different levels uh, <laughs> of political things going on and uh, theological things going on. We're going to laser-like focus on the messianic idea. Uh, and we're going to look at it in the framework of what I delineated before uh, in, the, in, in that introduction, um, that we're looking at a framework of two worlds, the now and the future. It's a little bit like, <laughs> it's a, little bit like a, a temporal Gnosticism, if you like. It's a war between the now and the future. It's the stuff of science fiction. As much of apocalyptic literature is, by the way. We actually have a very interesting reflection of that apocalyptic and messianic effervescence. And we have it in a very, very solid documentary form in one of the most famous uh, pieces of... Uh, <laughs> the artefacts of Jewish history that we have... and one of the most valuable, which is, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in the writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and once again, <laughs> that, that's the subject, and I don't want to go into that in great detail right now, uh, but what the general picture, and uh, there are probably even people listening to this talk that are more um, they're more expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls than I am, for sure, but... My understanding is, from what I've read of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the bits that I've read and looked at and, you know, poked around a bit, is that really there, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls in its overall apocalyptic picture is giving us two messiahs. It's giving us, and this is interesting, because it means that the, the uh, concept of the messianic idea is still in some state uh, fluid. We're going to watch it get a little less fluid in the next couple of weeks, but it's, it's, it's fluid. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and obviously even the subject of who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls is a, is a subject of considerable discussion in scholarship. There are some theories. Those theories get revised. It's probably now more likely that it's connected with... Uh, that, that, that the mystical groups that, um, that were sitting around the Dead Sea creating these documents were possibly more aligned with Sadducean mysticism than with Pharisaic. There may have, that may be an oversimplification as well. There's a number of different facets of it. But what we get is we get two messiahs. One messiah is a messiah that's called, and I love this term, and I actually think they should adopt this term, 
uh, for... Uh, no, they shouldn't. No, they shouldn't. No. I won't make that joke because it wouldn't be funny right now. Uh, it, it is a... Uh, it, 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 it is a... It is a Messiah which the Dead Sea Scrolls refers to as the teacher of righteousness. So the teacher of righteousness could be a fulfillment of the classic idea that we talked about uh, last week, the biblical picture uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the just and righteous lawgiver who is also the king and the, and the saviour and so on. Uh, although it seems to have a particular inflection in the Dead Sea Scrolls what the teacher of rightnesses is. And the other Messiah that emerges from the Dead Sea Scrolls is a Messiah, the son of Aaron, a Ben Aharon, which means that it is a priest. So that's another interesting facet of that type of eschatological apocalyptic thinking that's happening around that time, uh, because... Let's 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 if you, if if you're a messianist in the first century in the early first century, let's sum up your problem. <laughs> your problem is this: the promises made by the prophets. which were apparently not fulfilled in the biblical period or even coming out of the biblical period. And the spirit of Judah the Maccabee, who is only a century and a half behind you, they are all in the past. The Roman occupation is the present. And it's overwhelming. And any thoughts of overcoming it seem impossible. And would be impossible without divine intervention. That's your fundamental problem going into the first century. And tonight, really, I'm going to talk basically about two messiahs. I know I keep making these prelude remarks, but they're all important, and they're important because they're going to figure in later on. I'm going to talk about two messiahs, and I want to try and understand with you, or by myself while you watch, I'm going to try and understand what the relationship between these two completely different visions of the messianic idea are that both emerge out of Judaism. And both are, in a way, supported by the roots of Judaism in the Bible and in Jewish history and in Jewish thought and in Jewish ideas. And yet they are so completely different. And they are approaching the whole Messianic project in different ways. The first person I want to talk about, the first Messianic figure of the two that I'm going to discuss... And there's no need to say you might have heard of because you'll have both have heard of both of them. You'll all have heard of both of the messiahs I'm going to talk about. But the first I want to talk about is Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> and as as you I mean, as you can imagine, uh, I want you to imagine being me right now, uh, scholar in residence, Caulfield Shul, uh, about to talk to this august and learned crowd uh, that's watching at home uh, when maybe even exposing this to their families that I'm going to talk about Jesus. And I, and I also would know that you would understand that Jesus of Nazareth is an extremely complex topic, even without the minefield of Jewish uh, perspectives on Jesus, which I'm going to, for the most part, try and avoid and try and get to the bottom of what Jesus is as a phenomenon. I'm not going to give a lecture, for the most part, on the history of what emerges from Jesus, because that is called Christianity. And uh, that is not the subject of this talk, because there does come a point where uh, we can reasonably validly call it no longer Jewish history. We call it uh, something else. 
uh, unless, except where it intersects, with, and it always intersects with Jewish history, but uh, we're looking at Jesus as a messianic manifestation. And the thing is that when we come into the first century, we have, Jesus is by no means, and Jesus is, you know, Jesus' life is, if we understand him to be historical, uh, and that is a subject also of scholarly speculation, although uh, it seems, uh, the consensus seems to waver from time to time. And at, at the moment, it would appear that people want to say, OK, let's treat him as historical. I, I'm, I'm, I'll address that in a moment. But uh, we know that he wasn't the only Messiah of that period. And in fact... Now, one of our massive sources for the detail we know about this period, particularly in Judea, is, of course, Josephus, uh, which is not the only documentation because there is this documentation called the New Testament. And so a lot of the facts and descriptions that we have in Josephus are kind of reflected in parts of the New Testament, such as the Book of Acts and so on whether or not they took them from Josephus or what the interrelationship of that is, once again, scholars are always climbing all of those. We're just, the only thing we can really grasp onto here are the big themes that help this idea move forward, but it should always be backed up by sources. So Josephus writes there of the uh, first few decades of the first century that there are quite a number of uh, different messiahs and they have different features. Uh, he doesn't always... Refer to they're, they're, he doesn't refer to them necessarily as messiahs, but they are saviors of some form that are emerging from the pressure cooker that I described of the reality of the Roman occupation and uh, a desire and a longing, not only to get rid of that, but uh, to restore the older orders. And the only way that's going to happen is through divine intervention, which may as well create a completely new world as well, perhaps. So he talks about, uh, and, 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 and interestingly enough, in, well, one thing that seems to be common to Josephus' description of these messiahs is that he, um, is, is we see the return of what we might call the warrior messiah. So uh, he's actually going to be uh, commanding an army and he's going to be a huge warrior, he's going to walk around with a big sword and uh, that's going to be a whole aspect to his particular mission is that he is a warrior messiah, so he's literally going to fight the battles. And so you have a figure like uh, J Judah of Galilee, uh, who's talked about in a number of different sources, um, and uh, as someone who was trying, you know, in the early part, probably probably as a consequence of the early census in the, first, in the very early years of the, uh, of the Roman census, in the early years of the first century, but arousing people because thinking that, you know, well... Uh, if we have the right motives and if God's on our side, then why shouldn't the spirit of Judah the Maccabee return to us and so on? Uh, and, but he also talks about this... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, well, Judah of Galilee is actually mentioned in the book of Acts as a failed Messiah. And the book of Acts also mentions another uh, Messiah mentioned by Josephus, which is uh, a Messiah called Theodos, which, who, by the way, has a different shtick going on but nevertheless a shtick that feeds into the increasingly complex picture of what this and who this saviour is, and that is that Theodos was a miracle worker. So, you know, miracle working, you're going to walk around, you're going to split rivers, you're going to heal people, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. You're a faith healer, you're a miracle worker. Another aspect of it, and so we're starting to see these things. Oh, you're a warrior, you're a faith healer, you're a miracle worker. Well, you're like the ultimate dude, and then... Oh, my gosh, what if you're as well, you're a king? Oh, and we haven't even got to the level where it's a scholar yet. But we can see that the messianic idea is accreting all of these things that the Messiah is supposed to be able to do, or which represent a facet of the messianic project. But whether, just, whether Jesus is historical or not is <laughs> definitely a manifestation of the Jewish idea. Uh, and we can see that now we've got to go into Jesus because Jesus is, uh, he's a, he's, he's, he takes from everyone. It's like uh, if you created a, a synthesis of all of the different uh, facets of a Messiah, 
uh, that were existing in the milieu that Jesus was, uh, in which Jesus lived, he would be the composite ultimate Messiah in all but one respect. In all but one respect. And, and that is the interesting thing we're going to maybe talk about um, in, a, in, a, in a little while. Uh, because the one respect in which Jesus was not that was warrior. Jesus built an entire philosophy on powerlessness, uh, supposedly, ideally, at least uh, uh, it would appear so at, at, at the source of his teachings. And I, um, and, uh, but in every other way he did. Jesus comes onto the scene. Jesus, there's a whole discussion in uh, Christological scholarship which, um, you know, I only go into occasionally when, uh, when I have to put my bathers on and swim around in there. But it would appear that there is a discussion on whether or not, in fact, Jesus was aware of his messianic mission and his, and his unique status uh, theologically and in history and in the cosmos prior to his famous baptism. He was baptized by John the Baptist. And it's very interesting because what emerges from here is that John the Baptist is an Elijah the prophet figure. And we know that Elijah the prophet comes before the Messiah. We know that from the book of Malachi. We know it from uh, the teachings of the sages. Elijah the prophet comes. What exactly Elijah the prophet does? Well, Malachi tells you, and all of the rest of it. He reconciles generations. He reminds, brings everybody, goes back to the law of Moses, whatever. But it's all a bit vague. And for the rabbis, of course, Elijah the prophet, you need Elijah the prophet because he's going to be the one who's going to tell you that's the Messiah. And along comes John the Baptist. Uh, but he, John the Baptist is only kind of configured as Elijah the prophet <laughs> not in his own right, but really only after he baptizes the Messiah. Then it's realized that he's John the prophet. Uh, he's, he's Elijah the prophet. It's an interesting uh, paradigm shift there, but uh, that's when he emerges. And we could almost be... F uh, we, 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 we have reasonable suspicion to assume that if Jesus is a historical figure, then that event happened. It's, it's recorded, uh, actually, Jesus and John the Baptist are both mentioned by Josephus. Now, I know that some of you are sitting there going, oh, da -ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. don't you know, don't you know, David, it's an interpolation, it's all, I am... What, what was it, what was it that, uh, what was it that Terminator, that line that used by Terminator, he says... I have extensive files. Yes, I'm familiar with that. But nevertheless, John the Baptist does appear in Josephus. Jesus appears a couple of times, one where it looks like an interpolation and one where it's possibly not. But it's interesting because they are now a part of the historical narrative. And they're Jewish. <coughs> and this Jewish boy, uh, whatever post, Jesus' construction was made about his biography. He is a man who displays a certain sensitivity and complexity uh, and um, of thought. Well, complexity, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's the discussion about whether or not uh, or, or how Jewish the New Testament is. Once again, I, I, I feel myself getting drawn into that and I want to just walk the rope that we're walking to look at this in a more from, from the perspective of history. One book, however, that is not the, 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 the text that really that is not historical in its outlook would be the New Testament particularly the Synoptic Gospels. But a lot of people make f a big fuss about this. They go, oh, da 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 da, da. look. I mean, and, and of course, uh, that's the underlying basis of Jewish Christian polemics. Look what they did in the New Testament. They ripped out these verses, whatever. But that fails to actually understand that the New Testament is written, for the most part, certainly the Synoptic Gospels, it's written as a pesher. And a pesher is a unique genre of Jewish literature where you take the verses of the Bible 
and you interpret them according to events in your own day. And for that purpose, you can even take them out of context. It's like a, a midrash that is looking at reality uh, as though it's manifesting whatever isolated verses the Bible is talking about. We saw the famous, for example, the famous Pesha on Habakkuk, which was in the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on. So you see examples of Pesha. And the New Testament is, is that. Yes, it is true. They take verses out of context to try and justify events that either did happen or didn't happen in Jesus' life and so on. But to understand that, there is a unique hermeneutic, a messianic hermeneutic of reading texts being developed uh, right at that time. So it's no, uh, it's no surprise that the Synoptic Gospels emerge as, as, as a product of, or certainly influenced by that. There are so many features of Jesus' career that influence the messianic idea or are influenced by it that go on to have historical significance. You remember last week I spoke about that one of the features of the Messianic period is what Jeremiah had called the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant. For Jesus, this really is nothing less than the promise of a new Torah. Now, the promise of a new Torah kind of became even a little bit mainstream within Judaism in some quarters, in some various mystical texts and, and in other places, that we will in fact, it's not, a, it's not a consensus opinion, but that we will in fact get a new Torah. But Jesus wasn't going to wait for that. He decided that since he has this messianic mission that he can then, uh, he can then uh, uh, change the Torah. And in fact, uh, and, and, and those who say, oh no, 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 Jesus didn't do anything inconsistent with the Torah... Um, well, we have um, we have a couple of famous episodes that show that Jesus's philosophy was not exactly in accord with the directions that Judaism was ultimately going to take. For example, I mean, sometimes I I I, th I think of Jesus as being like. And I, I certainly don't want to offend anyone that might be watching this that uh, that uh, is is Christian in their faith because I want you to watch to the end of this to see how I resolve it. But I I I, I sometimes feel that Jesus comes across as a bit like a uh, a well-intentioned but slightly indignant reform rabbi. Uh, someone who believes that at the end of the day, uh, Pharisaic halakha, uh, Pharisaic law, is uh, the problem. So he and his followers are in a field and the followers are hungry and they want to pick some of the, the grain, some of the wheat to eat and it's Shabbat. And Jesus said to them, oh, what's your problem? The Shabbat was made for man, not man for the Shabbat. So... Hungry, pick it. You want to eat it. An example of something that, on the surface, sounds extremely reasonable, but where the thinking underlying it is extremely not Jewish. The Shabbat was not made for man. The Shabbat, and man was not made for Shabbat, and Shabbat was not made for man. Shabbat was made for the world by God. Zecher l'ma'asev reshit and given to man to be a custodian of it. It's kind of a totally different thinking that Jesus has got on there. He's breaking the shackles of the Sinaitic covenant and he's going to override the Torah. I mean, why, for example, why, for example, do we say in Kiddush, I'm not going to get on a soapbox about this, I'm just going there as a footnote, why do we say at Kiddush, Zechel HaMaasev Reshit and Zechel Etziat Mitzrayim, in memory of the creation of the world and in memory of the going out of Egypt, to show that Shabbat actually has two facet, fundamental facets to it, <laughs> obviously, as Rosenzweig pointed out. It has two fundamental facets to it. One is creation and the other is redemption. 
And Jesus skips over all of that depth and goes, yeah, 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 yeah. What we're trying to do is break down the, 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 the Pharisaic perception of what the Torah is. Yep. Others will disagree with my analysis. Others will vehemently disagree with my analysis. And others will think it doesn't make sense. But I present it for what it's worth. And uh, I don't, once again, I'm not here to offend people. I believe that we can uh, have discussions uh, with other spiritual systems or any spiritual system, even Judaism, even one as foreign as Judaism, uh, in a respectful way. But on that subject of grace superseding law, obviously the pivotal moment and the pivotal person in relation to the messianic idea in Judaism manifest as what eventually became Christianity is, of course, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, <coughs> whose entire career really <laughs> is the messianic idea in Jewish history. And it is Paul, and I'm not going to go into Paul's biography now, because Saul of Tarsus is Paul. Paul's biography now uh, to um, go into how he became from a student of Rabban Gamliel to become the chief proponent of uh, Christian thought and, 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 and literature of the, of the early church. But the essence of what Paul is doing and what Paul is saying is that uh, you don't need to keep all of the commandments that the rabbis are telling you to keep in order to partake in the covenant of the God of Israel, which promises redemption and which promises salvation, actually. You don't need it. Because the law, because Jesus died for our sins, therefore the law... That's the ultimate sacrifice. There's no more sacrifices to be made. He not only made the ultimate sacrifice, he also fulfilled ultimately all of the promises of the promise. He's, he's it. He's, it's happened. And now there's a new Torah. There's a new law. There's a law of grace. Which means that you don't need to become circumcised to partake in that covenant. You need to circumcise your heart, as the prophets tell us, but you don't need it in the flesh. And that really is one of the big moments of transition towards the separation of uh, Judaism and the nascent Christianity. Because uh, bodily circumcision is a fundamental, <laughs> absolutely inalterable foundation of uh, the concept of Brit, of the covenant that uh, the Abrahamic religions uh, have uh, with God, but Christianity uh, decided that it wasn't going to go there. You, you know, in the in, in the early uh, first century, there was a famous uh, book. I, I alluded to this last week. There's some big texts on the Messianic idea. Uh, written uh, over the course in scholarship in the last hundred years. And about a century ago, uh, one of the big books that came out that was like the standard uh, scholarly work considered by many on the subject of the Messianic idea, and it was called the Messianic idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner. So Klausner has a very, uh, a very, a very kind of uh, poignant thesis there about ultimately why Judaism and Christianity separated. And he argues, and, 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 I'm, and, I'm, and I'm quoting him, I mean, obviously I've read uh, quite a bit, but I'm quoting him because uh, I don't know anyone that's actually uh, put it more poignantly uh, or has come up with a better idea. But it's basically a fault line that has, theologically, that is, still exists in the difference between Judaism and Christianity. And that is that the individual salvationism promoted by the project of Jesus was ultimately rejected by the emphasis within Judaism upon social redemption. So long as there are people in the world who are suffering injustice, 
or suffering in any way, the Messiah has not come. I mean, maybe, you, you know, in the age of the Messiah, you could still stub your toe and it'll hurt for a few days. But we're talking about systemic injustice, war, slavery, the game of power played by nations against each other, destruction of the environment, rampant diseases. All of these don't exist in the Messianic age, and we're not there yet. And so long as they don't, then you don't have social redemption, whether by divine intervention or not. You don't have it. And the Christians were saying, well, you know what? Actually, the kingdom of God is where we really want to head over here. I mean, that's the long-term game. And the long game is, tells us that we need to believe in Jesus and that by faith in the, in the blood of Jesus, then that, that he made the sacrifice then we gain the grace because we believe in the Messiah. We earn it by our faith in him. Interestingly enough, there's a dualism within Christianity on that as well in relation to the into that belief and and it's uh, it's it's the tension between that and and love in practice and good works and so on. But you know, in the words in the words of. Uh, later scholars uh, observing Christianity is that uh, obviously it's a very easy trick because all of the good stuff, all of the goodies that the Jewish people are expecting for in the Messianic age, that world that I just described with no war, no disease, no slavery, no injustice, those goodies need to wait for the second coming. The first one was just to establish that you have to believe in that sacrifice and in that Jesus was the Son of God and that Jesus, uh, Jesus' death act, you know, atoned for your sins. And then if you promote that faith and you live by that faith, then uh, eventually at some point later in history, you know, basically... Yeah, 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 where the, the Jews, uh, what they're waiting for will come. In a way, Christianity is brilliant. I'm only going to talk about Jesus and Christianity for a couple more minutes because I want to talk about my second Messiah tonight. But, uh, but, but, but it's, 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 it's a brilliant synthesis, basically, of all of the messianic expectations that we've discussed. On the one hand, if you, if you, look, at, if you look at Tanakh, you'll see that there are basically and I've discussed this in other talks on Tanakh, is that there's basically three, um, three pillars of the way of, 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 of the power structure and the way in which society is organized and governed. You've got the king, and you've got the priest, and you've got the prophet. There's a king, there's a high priest, there's a prophet... And each of those is their own stream within the complex power arrangements of ancient Israel. And interestingly enough, Christianity in Jesus sees in Jesus the fulfillment of all three. First of all, Jesus is a king. He's of Davidic descent. So that's a fulfillment of the kingly role. He is obviously described as when he comes back, he's going to be this warrior and he's going to be a righteous king he's going to or everything we've described in the messianic picture emerging from the bible as the king but he's also the fulfillment of the prophetic because the prophetic is saying that it's going to be someone lowly but also preoccupied with justice and jesus fulfills the prophetic mission to want to transform society from the now to the ideal future. And he fulfills the role of priest. Because what do the priests do? The priests sacrifice. And Jesus is the greatest priest of all because he actually sacrificed himself. I, um, I'm going to spend a minute before I start talking about the next Messiah... Because um, obviously some of you will already have thoughts towards uh, <laughs> 
what's Christianity doing in the world? I mean, you, you cannot have an ideology and a hegemony of thought with so much power over so much time and so, so great a level of interaction with the Jewish people without thinking, well, maybe there is a cosmic purpose behind that. It's not a random... It didn't just, you know, get it wrong and, you know, we've suffering ever since. They are obviously part of the divine uh, picture if you are a Kabbalist. And Christianity is mystically explained, and I'm going into this only because it is a distinct part of the uh, Jewish idea in, of the messianic idea, so of the messianic idea in Jewish history, because it's going to have, it has influence later on, particularly uh, in the Middle Ages that we'll look at. But the idea is, is that Christianity is in fact, uh, and it came through Rome precisely because it is a spiritual projection into, an ethno-spiritual projection into history of uh, the brother of Jacob, Esav. That makes sense. If the Jewish people throughout their history are referred to as Jacob, then you can be fairly sure that there is another entity in the world that is referred to as Esav. And there are many mystics that point to different aspects of this, that how, how Esav is a projection, so is Yishmael, therefore Islam is also a projection, and they play an entire role in the, uh, the project of redemption and synthesis that is the task of the Jewish people. And on that level, on the level of Sod, you would be aware, of course, that the gematria of Esav is 376, which, of course, uh, multiplied by 10 is 3760, and 3760 is, of course, the year zero in the secular counting because that is the point of axis where Esav overtakes uh, the world on the level of Zman. So we are, in fact, when we count the year 2021, we are, in fact, counting uh, within the system of Esav. I'd like to see that on calendars, actually, the, uh, the Esavian year. Now, but, 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 just before we move on to the next Messiah, I want to, uh, <laughs> I want to just highlight that thing that I said a little earlier about Jesus, that he seems to combine it all, but he's got this powerlessness thing going on, this turn the other cheek, this I'm going to submit myself to the Romans, I'm going to let them crucify me, I'm not going to run away. I don't believe in taking down nations and let Rome have what Rome has and Caesar can have what Caesar has because at the end of the day, there's only one thing that matters and that's the kingdom of God. And so all of the power plays here are irrelevant to that. I come from God and therefore God is the ultimate power. So any power that humans have is pointless. This is a very, very, very deep and transformative idea. It's an idea, obviously, that has its own echoes in Eastern spirituality, in uh, Buddhism, and so on. And I, I, I just venture to walk you past those doorways that you can go down to look at these ideas uh, in more detail. But there is a distinct philosophy of powerlessness that is not irrelevant. I mean... I know that the Christians picked up on this, but it does say, I mean, the prophet Zechariah does say that your king is coming, Ani, as a poor man, al Khamor, and Val Ayer ben Atonot, so he's riding on a donkey. So obviously, you know, Jesus had to ride on a donkey, I'm saying, but it's an emblem of, of, of poverty and the great trope that came out out of, even out of the Middle Ages, was the Messiah as a pauper. Uh, I mean, we'll look at that later on when we talk about some of the Messiahs uh, of, of later generations uh, and how they, uh, they approached the Messiah as a, as a powerless pauper. And that's how they expected to find him, what he was doing. A beggar, even. So Jesus has got that going on. It's going to feed into the Messianic idea. It's not the big blazing king. And it's certainly not a warrior king. And that is exactly a warrior messiah. And that is exactly 
what the second Messiah I want to talk about tonight, and I haven't left myself a lot of time, so I'm going to have to get through this very quickly. <laughs> but you all know who I'm going to talk about, don't you? You do, right? Good. I'm going to talk, obviously, about a very different messianic energy. The return of the warrior spirit of Judah Maccabee. Now, Judah Maccabee lived uh, nearly 300 years before this individual's big moment on the stage. But I'm talking, of course, about Shimon Bar Koseva. And Shimon Bar Koseva, <laughs> well, what can we say? A failed Messiah. You see, we would regard Jesus as a failed Messiah because he says, I'm the Messiah. And then we look around, he goes, as Jesus says, Anna Mashiach. It's questionable whether he said Anna Mashiach. He says, Anna Mashiach. And people are looking around going, oh, I don't think so. Uh, the Romans are about to kill us. This does not look like Anna Mashiach to me. But the next significant figure in Jewish history that does say Anna Mashiach and uh, who has some of the great Gedolim, some of the great sages of that age, who also say, you know what, we think you might be, is of course Shimon Bar Koseva, otherwise known by those sages who supported him as Shimon Bar Kochba. And he's called Bar Kochba after the prophetic verse that I quoted last week, Darach Kochav Mi Yaakov, that famous verse, uh, from a Sefer Bamidbar, uh, that at the end of days a star shall arise out of Jacob. And since that does not seem to have been fulfilled yet in any kind of permanent messianic state, it lo and because <laughs> any intervention against the Roman Empire in the first half of the second century under no less than Hadrian, whose hegemony ruled all the way from Hadrian's Wall in Scotland right through to the Persian border. The idea that there would be an apocalyptic fight against the Romans would have been considered as having no chance of success without divine intervention. And if you've got divine intervention at that level, then you're going to be ushering in a new world. Because that would be amazing. But Bar Kokhba's fight, look, Bar Kokhba is really, it's a, there's a way of looking at Bar Kokhba to say, okay, <laughs> it's possible that Bar Kokhba was, even for some of the letter writers to the AJN, Bar Kokhba was a shtickle right wing. And he was, <laughs> he was a nationalist. And it's very easy to see Bar Kokhba as the culmination of the whole project of the Kanaim, the great leaders, zealot leaders, who were def fighting the Romans as, as part of a nationalistic project to determine the autonomy and the freedom of the Jewish people in their own land, to restore basically the Maccabean picture. And to get the Rome the hell out of there. But Bar Kokhba should also be very closely seen, not merely as a nationalist resistance to the Roman occupation, but a defense of Judaism. The reason scholars like Rabbi Akiva supported Bar Kokhba is because Bar Kokhba was at the end of the day fighting against the Roman oppressions against Judaism and Hadrian's persecutions which were designed to eradicate Judaism. We could potentially live under foreign dominance. I mean, we did it back with the Persians and to some extent with the Greeks. We, but <laughs> we have to be allowed to, uh, we have to be allowed to, uh, to observe Judaism because otherwise, for what possible purpose or reason are we here? in this land. So it's kind of like harking back to the same argument as Judah Maccabee, but this time, there ain't no Seleucids. These are the Romans. Um, that is why the rabbis said to him, you know, that's how they called him, you're not Bar Koseva. 
and you're not Bar Kochba. You're Bar Koziva. Koziva meaning falsehood. They designated him as that in much of Talmudic literature because they definitively regarded his efforts to fight the Romans by force of arms, which ended in utter failure and destruction on a scale unseen to that point. A complete eradication of the nation from that land. The change of the name of the land to Palestine. The banishment, the death of hundreds of thousands of people and banishment and exile and poverty and destruction and to cap it all off even Jerusalem has a new name now and Jews are not allowed anywhere near it. That was the outcome of Bar Kokhba's Messianic project. So they called him Bar Koziva. There's a famous uh, Midrash. Uh, I'm going to read you this Midrash now. It's a Midrash from uh, Echa Rabba. It's also found in Yerushalmi, but it's from Echa Rabba. So it's said, uh, I mean, they're saying uh, that there are rabbis that were interpreting a star shall set forth out of Jacob. Don't uh, call it Kochav, says the, says the Talmud Yerushalmi, but call it Kozev. He wasn't a star, he was a liar. Kad Rabbi Akiva, and it relates that when Rabbi Akiva kad havichame lelahadin bar koziva, when Rabbi Akiva saw this bar koziva, this bar kochba chap, have Amar, he said of him, and I mean the Talmud is speaking very derogatorily of bar kochba. I mean, he's placed by some segments of the Jewish world on this kind of nationalistic freedom fighter pedestal, but the Talmud doesn't like him. They said, when Rabbi Akiva saw him, Rabbi Akiva said, Have Amar, Hainu Malka Mashicha. Oh, that's the King Messiah. He's right there. Because he's fulfilling it. He's doing it. He's, he, I mean, don't forget that for, for three years or so, Bar Kokhba had managed to carve out some kind of independent nationalist entity around Jerusalem and so on before Hadrian went spectacular and brought a billion soldiers to end it all at Beitar. But he says, Rabbi Akiva said, You're the, that's the Messiah. Amale Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta. So, a famous um, statement of Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta, contemporary of Rabbi Akiva's, who after Rabbi Akiva said of Bar Kokhba, that's the King Messiah, Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta turned to him and he said, Akiva, Ya'alu asavim belchaech, grass, will grow in your cheeks. Meaning, you're going to be dead in the ground with grass growing through you. And he still won't have come. Astonishing statement. Astonishing statement. Astonishing rebuke. And astonishing because Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta is kind of, in a way negating this fundamental idea that we have that the Messiah can come at any day. But he's saying to Rabbi Akiva, not only are you wrong, you are so wrong that this failed project of Bar Kokhba will set back the coming of the Messiah for a long time yet. There's another famous Midrash I just want to share with you from Yalkut Shimoni. It's a bit of a later midrash than 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 the than the Echa Rabba or the uh, Targum Yerushalmi where that text was found, but it's it's it, Yalkut Shimoni brings a very interesting text. Hadabar Koziva Malach Tartin Veshanin Nupalga Tartin Shni Nupalga. So Bar Kochba ruled for two and a half years, which is about right. Amaluhul Rabbanan, he said to the rabbis. I'm the Messiah. Amrulo, they said to him. No. But Mashiach Ktiv, in relation to the Messiah, it's written, Vaharicho, and he shall smell it. Now, 
If you recall, that's from last week. This is Tanakh. If you recall from last week, I read there from the Tanakh. I read a. Uh, the, 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 I read that section because that's from that's from Yeshayahu eleven. That's from the book of Isaiah chapter eleven. Which, as we read last week, because it's the famous uh, Yishai passage, you know, that a shoot shall grow out of the stump of Jesse. This is the big idea, even during Hezekiah, of something yet to come, some greater Sion of David that is going to come and be the righteous ruler. And it says, in verse 3, it says, Vaharicho biyirat Hashem. expression is a bit ambiguous, but what a lot of people understand that to mean is v'harichob b'yirat Hashem from the Messiah has a sense, like like um, from l'hariach, which is to smell. It is, a, it is a sense of judgment, of righteous judgment that is like a smell and it's through the fear of God. From Reach, from a smell. It's a hefil of Reach, the Hariach. So he's able to even discern justice by smell, a kind of maybe a kind of a metaphysical smell. I don't know. But, but they said to Bar Kokhba, Bar Kokhba said, Allah Mashiach. So they said to him, Ah. It's written there, Vaharicho. Dumeriach Vadain. That he can smell certainties. And you are anything but certain. Meaning, there's a very unsure outcome of this. What the Midrash seems to be implying is that you're not Mashiach by your claim, you're Mashiach by the reality of what you've achieved. If you, Bar Kokhba, are running around going, I'm a Mashiach, but you've got half a million guys holed up in Beitar with a million of Zahedrin soldiers surrounding you, that's hardly I'm a Mashiach. Go and defeat them and restore a world order of social justice and then maybe Anna Mashiach will be saying it as well. Beitar obviously was the site at which Bar Kokhba was killed. There's some very famous Midrashim. We're not, this is not a class on Midrash. We're sticking with Jewish history. But the defeat of Beitar is a fairly well-documented historical event. Uh, and it was completely devastating the uh, uh, the question is I mean what, what sort of choice was there um, and there had to be a fight and perhaps a more charitable comparison of Bar Kokhba would be with um, you know a British commander like Bodica who was also fighting a similar fight and uh, um, but Bar Kokhba's fate was that he was uh, he was slaughtered along with Numerous others at Beitar. Now, Klaus now has another interesting observation, and I want to just uh, talk about this for a minute before we wind up. Because I'm fascinated how, look, Jesus and Bar Kokhba are within a century of each other. And yet they are so fundamentally different. Jesus coming in a project that effectively overturns Judaism with a theory of powerlessness and where the Pharisaic factions are kind of put in the same basket as the Roman occupation. That's just all wrong. And Bar Kokhba, who is a defense of Judaism, with a warrior ethic. Now, God's on our side, we can do this. Judah Maccabee did it 300 years ago, I can do it again now. They are so fundamentally different, yet they are both Jewish ideas of the Messiah. And they remain till today Jewish ideas of the Messiah.
And I'm going to touch now on, in the next five minutes, I'm going to wind up in just a few minutes, but I want to touch on a, a, a topic that I want to bring this together that kind of relates back to what I said right at the beginning of the talk when I quoted that Midrash uh, found in the Gemara, in that brighter in Sukkah. What emerges from the Bar Kokhba period with all its devastation and, and, and what happens to the messianic idea? It seems to us that perhaps the two facets or the two perspectives on the Messiah have in a way been misappropriated. On the one hand by Christianity, on the other hand by the defeated Beitar. What does that leave us with? Well, it leaves us with something very interesting, because what emerges after Beitar is a fascinating paradigm that kind of tries to mediate between the two ways in which you get from the now to the future. You can transform the now, or you can destroy it. That's what we've seen so far. But out of the aftermath of Bar Kokhba comes a very unique idea within Judaism that is profound in its reach because it reaches temporally in both directions and that is the idea of that there are in fact two messiahs within Judaism, within the Jewish picture. There is the messiah, the son of David that we have discussed and there is the messiah, the son of Yosef, the son of Joseph, a descendant of Jeroboam, of Jeroboam and the split of the northern kingdom. So that which was called in general terms Ephraim and Ephraim and Yehuda, the two tribes that form this dialectic within Jewish history and they each have a Messiah in a way. And what happens to the Messiah son of Joseph in the classic picture emerging as we come from the, the late Tanaitic, the late Second Temple, the, the aftermath of Bar Kokhba, beyond the late Second Temple, the, 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 it, through the Talmudic and the Midrashic periods to come towards the Middle Ages, is we have this, these two messiahs. And the classic picture is, is that the Messiah, son of Joseph, dies because he is the warrior Messiah. And he dies fighting the battles of the Lord, but bringing about the new order militarily. He is a korban, he is a sacrifice. Uh, utterly astonishing, of course, that Jesus' father's name was Joseph. I mean, depending on which way you look at it. Unfortunately, the Christians can't claim that he's the Messiah, literally the son of Joseph, because Joseph's not meant to be his father. But we won't go there right now. The Messiah, the son of Joseph, is a, in a way a sacrifice that uh, nevertheless, you know, you've all seen the movies where, where the hero uh, sacrifices himself to bring about the desired result. Ultimately, that's the Messiah, son of Joseph. The Messiah, son of David, the fulfillment of the prophetic vision is the usher in of the new transformed age, the king of righteousness. That then comes back to explain this Midrash, the Midrash that we read at the beginning about how the Messiah, son of David, asks for the Messiah, son of Joseph, to be resuscitated. It's not my role now, or even though I kind of, if I had another hour, I probably would not be able to help myself, but uh, to go into the metaphoric and metaphysical implications of that Midrash and what it would mean for the overall relationship between Judaism and Christianity at the end of days. Kabbalists are fairly certain now that the unique aspects, theological as Christian theological aspects of anti-Semitism have been eradicated from the world. It doesn't mean that there isn't anti-Semitism in the world, but I imagine that even in our world now, if Christian theological anti-Semitism rose its head, it would be quite quickly quashed. But, you know, that's, that's a hope of the world that's arrived at. So I mentioned Klausner, and I, I, I want to come back to Klausner because his, <laughs> he, his insights were cool. I mean, he, 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 he put this in this amazing way. But basically, in the paradigm of Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David, 
Mashiach ben Yosef, the idea of a Messiah son of Joseph emerges as a result of the failure of the Bar Kokhba rebellion. That would be what Bar Kokhba would have done, except it never really happened that way. Klausner says that Bar Kokhba is the origin of the Messiah who dies. And Jesus, Christianity, is the origin of the Messiah resurrected. Now, the Messiah resurrected is an idea that did not walk off into the sunset with Christianity and not leave itself some impression within Judaism. The Messiah resurrected is an idea that stayed within Judaism. And we will be coming back to that, no doubt, in weeks three and four. The birth pangs of the Messiah, this idea of Hevle Mashiach, that we have to go through some terrible, terrible, terrible periods before the birth pangs of the Messiah, something that we saw materialized in the 20th century that the great sages of Israel could not have even have imagined what that would be. You know, the Shoah followed by the establishment of the State of Israel, things that should still shock us still today, the juxtaposition of those two occurrences. But the idea that there would be birth pangs before the Messiah, an idea that you'll find right through the Talmud, is also in the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba uh, disillusionment. Because they sought to provide some kind of justification as to why we just went through this. And Klozner also argues that basically the spiritual and the physical aspects of the whole messianic notion are in tension. But after Bar Kokhba, the, politic, the, idea of, the political idea of the Messiah, the idea of the Messiah as someone who's going to be able to overturn the armies of nations to create the new restored order of the Davidic king and the, and the Torah and the Jews in the land of Israel as per the description of the prophets. Uh, it just wasn't tenable in any conceivable sense. We tried it. It completely failed because the divine did not intervene and it was not therefore part of the divine plan. It would appear that the divine plan as we stand here now in 2021, was for the Jews to go through uh, another 2,000 years of um, self-exploration. But what's fascinating, and the point I want to leave you with, is this. The rabbis, the great sages of Israel, are still among the smartest people I know. And their spiritual depth and insight is unfathomable. They leave us with an idea. They leave us with a picture that mitigates this whole tension between the world of the now and the world of the future. Because what Hazal do, what the sages of Israel do, is they create a third world That is, they take the messianic age and they separate it from the future, which they call Olam Haba, which is a whole basket full of ideas from the, you know, some kind of spiritual, ethereal, Garden of Eden, heaven type existence to us walking around as fully resurrected individuals, part of a giant AI, whatever it is that you want to describe Olam Haba, no eye has ever seen it except God's, so any speculation about Olam Haba is futile, but we do know that a big part of it will be the feature of the resurrection of the dead, but it's not, strictly speaking, part of the messianic idea. The messianic idea brings the, 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 the rabbis sought to create a what they called a messianic age. And in the messianic age, that is the restored world of, of, of its... Every, that's the Star Trek universe. Everything's good. No wars, no slavery, no disease, no injustice. That world. 
That's the Messianic age. The Jewish people in the land of Israel. Temple, yes. Temple, no. Temple, maybe. Whatever. The Jewish people in the land of Israel. The clearly the presence of God has created this utopia. But there's nothing fundamentally different about the nature of the world. That's the Messianic age. And that sorts out a whole lot of stuff. And the future... You can't bring it. Only God can bring that. The messianic age, however, can be brought about by a project of transformation of the now. The messianic age is the bridge between the now and the future. It is the world of the future embedded in the now. As opposed to the now embedded in the future, which is kind of... Uh, uh, the other way around. The Messianic Age is the bridge and it is the consequence of our efforts to transform this world to create it. So, I wanted to uh, cover those two figures. I wanted to set up some issues that we will be discussing uh, going forward. I Next uh, week will be uh, a challenging one. We'll going to find out who I'm going to talk about. But I just wanted to encapsulate by saying that the, the idea of the, the Messianic, when we talk about the Messianic idea in Jewish history, and you know that I'm interested in the way that it is propelled and propelled forward, uh, once we get into the next uh, part of it, because we have a very big Messiah that we're going to talk about probably at the beginning of, of next week in the 7th century and so on, and that will take us in, right through to the Middle Ages. Uh, but... Uh, Bear in mind, as I said at the very beginning of last week, that the fluidity and dynamics of the messianic idea in Judaism are always changing by necessity. Some people think there is this fixed static path picture, and we know already from Tanakh that that's not necessarily uh, what uh, is going to happen. Uh, but it is an idea that drives the Jewish people towards uh, making the world a better place whether the Messiah comes or not and it is that particular point of transformation of social transformation social and global transformation that is the idea that emerges from the rabbinic picture of Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David uh, in the rejection of Jesus and in the aftermath of the failure of military adventures and uh, on that note uh, I hope you all stay safe in lockdown and uh, wish you and your families.